Khan, uh, but he said he wasn't going to be on until a little later in the, in the meetup. Okay, cool. And I am now recording, so your your names are safe and can be used for security updates. <clears throat> okay, so uh, should I go? Yep, you should be able to take over. All righty. Uh, your uh, says I can't share because you're sharing. No, let me stop sharing. Sorry. No problem. All right, I'm going to do a Chrome tab. Hold shift. Does it let me choose the particular tab? Uh, it my, should. Yeah, do we you see, see my the, slides? We see all the tabs, not just those handful. Uh, okay, that's okay. Um, let me get my notes. Whoa. What the, where are my notes? Sorry, I've got to find my speaker notes. That was cool. Laser pointer. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Let's Google. Things. Oh, oh, I try. I, I turned that on when I was trying to turn my speaker notes on. <laughs> Remember, that's there. Cool. Okay. Um, so you see that? Okay, so I took this presentation from my DrupalCon presentation, but you know, modified it a little bit for the New Jersey meetup. Um, so I'm going to just talk about the automatic updates initiative. This is an ongoing initiative that's been uh, going for a few years and just I think about a year or so working uh, mostly in core or for stuff that will be in core. Um, Tom Ted Bowman, our principal software engineer at Acquia's Drupal Acceleration team, um, the main co-maintainers of letting letter layout builder and settings tray. Um, these are people who helped with the slides because a lot of the slides came from DrupalCon, so I can't take the blame or credit for all the slides. Um, if you're interested in working um, on the automatic updates initiative, uh, we definitely need a lot of help and there's a lot of different expertise that we need. Um, uh, uh, PHP, I, I highlight that because there's a lot of work like outside of Drupal core, um, this work in Drupal. Uh, we need Python help, we need UX help, and we definitely need a lot of people who understand Composer or like the internals of like how to make Composer plugins. Um, if you're interested, yeah, just um, the auto updates channel in Slack is pound auto updates. And I guess since, you know, it's a kind of smaller audience today, feel free to stop me uh, for questions along the way. Um, this is sort of a, a mixture of the two sessions that um, I was part of at DrupalCon, one more technical and one overview. So um, if people are interested in more technical stuff, their slides, and if people want to get down the details, yeah, feel free to ask. Um, so the initiative has been around for a while. There's a contrib module that supports seven and eight, but it's for non-composer sites. It does have securely signed updates and it displays critical PSAs. Um, so that's been around for a while um, and it's usable now. Um, so, you know, keeping up with Drupal updates is expensive. You have monthly security costs for, um, sorry, I'm going to increase my note font size. Um, you have a uh, cost of security releases, and that requires staff who knows Drupal, um, who could be doing other stuff besides um, doing updates. Um, we have situations like the Panama Papers, where this is a really high profile um, leak of financial documents because uh, somebody was running Drupal and WordPress sites uh, that weren't up to the latest security patches. I think they also had some other security problems that led to this, um, so definitely like a lot of high profile stuff can happen and you know your your um, if you're not update up to date with the latest security patches you can be our security releases you know you're vulnerable to hacks um, so a lot of sites are really slow to apply updates um, less than half of sites have been updated to the most recent um, update on January 20th 2021 hopefully you know Maybe that's less now, but at the time on DrupalCon, that was that was the case. Um, so we know people don't even with you know like all the work of the security team and all those sort of publication or or publicity around security releases. We know that you know not everybody has time or is able to to update or maybe has the um, has the bandwidth or knowledge of of what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of people running Drupal sites. It's not the only thing that they do. They do a lot of other stuff. Um, 
this is a case where you know the fastest we ever seen people update was in 2018 when there was a critical security release. 50% um, of site owners were updated within four weeks, but there, are, but the vulnerability was already be ex exploited in the wild within two weeks. So, um, you know, people who hadn't updated were being uh, were being attacked, and so or sites were being attacked. So this is sort of one of the main reasons, um, including cost of ownership for wanting auto updates in core is so that people um, don't have to spend as much time and money on updating and also are just updated sooner. Um, it's been one of the highest priorities in, in uh, open source software. This is a software, I think, uh, a survey from GitHub, cross open source um, users and security and stability are sort of the top concerns um, that were chosen and then also within Drupal um, there's I think this is from the 2020 product survey and automatic updates was chosen as one of the most important improvements and you know almost doubled the second uh, the second uh, voted thing there which is better docs and training which is also really important um, so the goals um, we're trying to make a secure user interface for automatically updating Drupal core and eventually modules along with their composer dependencies without breaking the live sites. So we're going to break down what some of that means. Um, so for security, um, we have chosen, so, sorry, I'm having trouble getting my notes again, get rid of the chat. Um, one of Drupal's selling points is a secure platform with an excellent security team but a lot of the advantages of the update system is they, if you have one, they also become a target for hackers. Um, and if you can compromise the update system itself, you can really compromise a lot of sites. An example of that is solar, the recent solar wind attacks, where it was a supply side uh, attack that, you know, attacked the actual system delivering updates. Um, so we definitely don't want the Drupal automatic update system to turn into something like that. So we've chosen um, to implement something called the update framework or TUF, and it's a framework for securing uh, for securing software update systems. And this is a widely used system. It's under the umbrella of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, there's a Python um, implementation of it that is kind of like the default implementation, but it's I think it, Go has one and some other languages and a lot of um, companies are using it. Um, even the automotive grade, automotive grade Linux is using it to send updates to cars. Um, so what we'll do in Drupal is we're gonna have a client library called PHPTuff um, that will be used by Drupal core and then Drupal.org will use the Python implementation to securely sign the updates. Um, so, So the first goal of the initiative is gonna be for only Drupal core, uh, attended and unattended updates. And the initial version will enable bug fix and security releases. So that'll be like, you know, nine, well, for whichever, whichever minor release it comes out in, say like, say it comes out in nine four, um, then that would enable updates for nine, from nine four zero to nine four one to nine four two, nine four three. But the initial MVP will not do like minor updates. So it wouldn't go from like uh, 10.00 to 10.1.0. So only patch releases. Um, and a lot of that is because the minor updates become a lot trickier with um, configuration updates and possible content database updates. Um, so we're, we're tr still trying to figure out like how we would handle cases where there is configuration updates in um in a patch release uh, though they that's the goal is not to have that um and in the future we would do updates to contrib modules but it gets a little trickier for uh contrib modules because core has a really like strict policy about what can get into patch releases so we're more confident doing automatic updates for patch releases whereas a particular contrib module we don't know their policy or how um how well they stick to it so you know, updating from a random contrib module uh, 1.1.1 1 .1 to 1.1.2 might be 
PC breaking if if somebody makes a mistake and there's maybe less eyes on it. So um, that's to be determined how that's going to be handled. And or it's this is going to be a composer aware system. So the idea is that it will update your composer dependencies. Um, if if they need to be updated, it'll just run composer update behind the scenes. Um, and the other goal is not to break the live site. So the idea that um, uh, let me see the next slide I'm showing this. There'll be a security checklist at the start to sort of make sure that you're ready. So it doesn't attempt to do an update if you're not ready. And also it will um, let you know uh, along the way, like it'll periodically check to see if you're ready to do an automatic update and we'll email you and say, hey, you know, your site isn't, um, if you have enabled, your site's not ready to do the next update so that you know that if there's a security release next Wednesday or something that you'll be at least the automatic update system will be ready to go. Um, and so how it's going to work is that we'll be using Composer in the update framework to secure the updates and we're going to stage them into a temporary folder and then while the site is still being accessible and then briefly after the update's been applied and everything hopefully has gone okay, then you know we might put the site into maintenance mode for a very brief amount of time and then um, uh, and then copy over the update. So it won't have to do like and hopefully copy over only the changed files, though we're still trying to figure out how that's going to work because we can't really rely on our sync being available everywhere or we're not sure that we're going to be able to. Because um, one of the things about um, the automatic updates initiative is a lot of sort of higher um, cost sites may have Drupal specific hosting and they may be, maybe will have Drupal CI workflow that they do for updates. So an automatic update system for Drupal is not necessarily going to be able to work. The whole, the whole, um, the whole system is not necessarily going to be able to work in those kind of situations, but for smaller sites sort of long tail sites of Drupal that don't have Drupal specific hosting and don't do um, don't have a CI workflow. Um, they they may be on hosting where you know they you can't do execution calls to composer um, from the command line you might not be able our sync might not be available so we're figuring out like how we're going to copy it over but the idea is the site would only be unavailable for a very short period of time. Um, so what we've been working on so far is uh, critical PSA, so a security advisories and core, package verification, site readiness checks, the core module itself, and then composer staged updates. So we're going to go through some of that. So critical PSAs and cores, the idea is that now we have up, we have notifications that an update is available for a particular for core or particular modules, but we don't have something ahead of time to say, hey, there's going to be a security release this Wednesday, and it's really critical, and you should apply it as soon as possible. Um, so the goal will be that either there is a upcoming uh, PSA, meaning like a really highly critical update is coming to Drupal core. And this is like something that maybe the type of um, messages that we're going to display in Drupal core itself are the kind of highly critical security updates that only happen um, once a year, once every two years. So not every security release for Drupal core or contrib, but only the most highly critical. Um, so we display them inside Drupal core. Um, and so we have an issue for this, and it just got committed a couple of days ago. So 9.2 and 9.2, this will be available. So it'll display, hopefully it won't display anything because hopefully there won't be any of these like highly critical once in every two year security releases anytime soon. But if there, uh, if there is, and you have 9.2 or above, you would see a notification um, in Drupal core itself. Any questions as we go by? I don't actually have the, I don't have the chat available or anything. Where I'm not looking at it. I got a question, Ken. Yeah. This is yeah. Kathy. Um, so if there was a core a critical, like rarely yeah. critical core yeah. update, mm -hmm. this would send people a notice in advance. Yes. 
and these are it's it's only the type of update that is already there's already advanced notice of these they're just not inside drupal it's not like a new type of okay we're going to it's not a new like security oh. security team policy like okay we're going to start to tell people ahead of time these are the kind of um updates kind of security releases that the security team already publicizes a few days ahead of time or maybe right the one the run where ted showed that half the people had updated within four weeks or something was the one where there was a, there was a psa i don't remember how long in advance but at least a few days before the actual release there's a psa that was like you better get ready because there's going to be like the most critical thing ever on wednesday and you better you know stay up all night and be ready to apply it um and so some people listened <laughs> yeah so yeah not a new yeah policy. that makes sense thanks yeah not a new policy as far as disclosure um and the other thing is i mean potentially this is in nine two obviously automatic updates is not done but when automatic updates is is done then people may want to like double check okay yeah i got automatic updates enabled and my site says that you know it's ready to apply an automatic update i mean you may want to check check that periodically anyways in the future but if you get one of these notices you might especially want to say okay we're going to just make sure that um when this comes out it's going to automatically update yeah Ted, yep I have, I have a question if unless kathy still has following up on that i guess we're good um you work for Acquia and you know that jj which is my company um has thou or literally hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands of websites yeah. um of course clearly not all of them are on are up to the latest and greatest and everything yeah. but will there be a way to get this sort of information or maybe it already exists um without having to actually log in each one of the pages in other words some sort of an api call that can say hey this site is down so that we can build reports and dashboards and all that sort of thing if yeah there's going to be readiness checkers um for if you're ready for an update is that what you're talking about or for if the security updates well, are, are coming email is one thing but yeah who does, who's the lucky person to get you know what address gets yeah, all the yeah. email yeah. um that's why i was saying if if we can in addition to email pull out yeah you know, um, make a request to the site on yep. a regular basis and not have to wait for yep. um, something so we can see, hey, we just knocked out five items on this site, but there's still 10 to go. And, you know, you yep. can see that going down. Um, obviously, people in an enterprise edition, they like to see things in, um, they're all about the numbers. Yeah. So that, that sounds like a feature request for update module to have an API to show you the available updates yeah so that kind of stuff would be available now but the update module doesn't really have a clean api to get that kind of stuff there is an issue to do that um, so once that is there and that would be in the update module itself then you know writing a console command to say you know show me all available updates or, or return to me all available updates should be pretty trivial um, yeah right now it's there's actually an example of what you have to do to, to get the update module to tell you the security updates. And it's really not very, you have to really know what you're doing. So part of the audit, we're cleaning, we're, we're working on some of the um, update module stuff too, because we're gonna, at least initially, we're gonna be using it to say, you know, tell us which, you know, what version of a particular module we should be updating to and what which one is the security release. Cause one of the things in the auto update module will be, I only want to automatically update for security releases, not anything else. Um, so right now, the update module doesn't really have a good way to tell you like, oh, this is a, um, or Composer doesn't have the information to say, hey, this is, an, this is a security release. The update module does have a way to tell you that, but it's not very clean to get it. So that is one of the issues that we're working on. As far as like a way to get the update, the, their current notification, the notifications about upcoming releases. You could do that once we're done by calling the API in core, but also like it's just a JSON feed from, um, from Drupal.org. 
So in a lot of cases, it may just be easier just to parse that JSON feed, which already exists, but right now, or is usually empty because this only has the feed of like the really highly critical security updates. All right, did I start at 720? Does anybody remember? Thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so we have the client, the PHP tough library, and then the PHP tough composer integration library. Um, and we've worked a little bit or you know, Joomla and typo three have showed shown interest in this. Um, I actually don't know that the sort of current practice of, of whether Joomla and typo three sites are always composer integrated, but um, I think last time we that they came to one of our virtual sprints was really before we started with the composer integration. It was just the PHP tough, which is just a, a way to, to sign packages and it's not really composer aware, um, but I'll sort of show how it works is there is sort of delegated authority on signing um, and the root JSON file would keep track of all the keys and it's kept in the, the root keys are kept offline. Um, then you, you go down from like time snap to snapshot to targets and targets is where you actually say, okay, um, I, you know, these are the files that I have signed and um, here's the signatures for them. And I have a little example of how this works. So um, how this would work once we get the, and we're pretty much, I guess, here probably is what we've, we've done is you have this fetcher, let me see. You have this uh, fetcher that you say, okay, I'm going to send this fetcher in and it's going to be able to um, pull files from my remote, um, the update, update framework repo. And right now our client repo is just memory storage, but um, this is because we haven't really got past the point of testing, but you would load your root JSON file and that's really all you need to have to update from the server. Usually you have a more, uh, you have if you've done this more than once, you have more of the JSON files locally. But you, um, let me see here. You basically create an updater, which is the PHP tough updater. Uh, you refresh it, which means it's going to go out and get all the new JSON files and make sure that um, it has all the latest signatures. And then you say, okay, I want to download this particular target file. Um, and the root JSON keeps all the keys and tells you um, which keys have been delegated to other responsibilities. And then when you download, um, there's a top level targets JSON, which you could have all your files in there, all the files that you're going to download, but usually would split it up into delegations. And so the delegations can be multi level. Um, and you could do it by directory if you wanted in, our, in say Drupal.org's case, if you wanted contrib in one directory and you wanted core in another one, and then maybe you wanted all the composer metadata in another directory, you can um, assign the, the assigning authority to those to different roles. Um, so this is an example of your, if you were getting that target file dot, um, target dash file dot text file, it would look at targets.json and then we go, it would go to the left here to the target file targets.json where it would have the information about the correct signature for that file. You'd download it and then you'd make sure that the signature would match. Um, another thing we're working on is tough is integration for our PHP tough library into composer. Um, so it's kind of tricky because composer doesn't really um, let you easily swap out the downloading of all the composer files. Um, but we've had a couple um, example in here would be how you might want to split it up if you were using it. You might want to have like a targets metadata JSON, which is all of the targets that are actually composer metadata. So if behind the scenes, when you do a composer update, it goes out from the packages and gets these packages, or maybe from the repository for each repository, um, you get packages.json, it would tell you, okay, um, Drupal.org's packages controls all these contrib files, um, and it would send you down a, a whole big JSON file called package.json. And um, basically, you want to make sure that that is signed correctly too, not just the Drupal core download, because if somebody could um, basically trick you into to not knowing 
the latest Composer metadata, then obviously you wouldn't have the latest version of Drupal to download. So they'd be able to do something like a what's called a freeze attack, just makes you not know about la the latest updates. Um, so we've talked to the Composer people about download, about integrating Tough um, directly um, into Composer itself. That's probably not going to happen before auto updates happens, but they've showed interest and they've definitely like helped us in uh, the Composer plugins that we're working with as far as like the, the Composer um, maintainers have given us a lot of good advice on how to do it correctly. Um, these are some PRs that um, Adam Honich on our team has been working with the Composer team on. A lot of these, I think all of these have gotten through now. Um, we're also working with the maintainers of the update framework spec itself, um, and they are doing something similar to our Composer integration with uh, PIP, which is the Python package index. No, that doesn't spell PIP. Anyways, the Composer version or the, the Python version of something like Composer uh, for, pack, for package downloads, they're working on integrating the update framework and the Python version of it directly into there so that they would have um, signed repository information. Um, on the server on Drupal.org would run, would need to run like a, uh, would need to not only sign all of Drupal core um, releases so that we would update them and make sure they're signed correctly, but would probably need to sign or to be a proxy for signing any vendor updates that would be required for Drupal core updates. And the tricky part with this is you don't really know for any particular, like if you had a generic version of 9.1.2 and you were downloading from 9.1.2 to 9.1.3, then, you know, for any, for a very generic version of Drupal, you could know what vendor updates would be required, but for a particular site, you never know what vendor updates are going to be required. So each one could have bumping up to a different version of Drupal, could have cascading effects and have different vendor dependencies. So basically for a secure, for an update to really be considered secure, all of those um, need to be signed, all those packages that you download need to be signed correctly. Um, so that's going to be kind of tricky on the Drupal.org side, but there's a uh, um, plans are in the works for sort of having a proxy signing mirror that when you're downloading something from packages, Drupal.org would have basically um, have downloaded it itself and have um, provide you with a signature that when you get this, you know, random vendor package um, that Composer wants would, would be able to tell you, yep, um, I have I have a signature for this. And if you check that, you know, the file matches the signature, then you're good. Um, of course, for stuff like private composer repos, that wouldn't work. So you'd have to do some work yourself in that case. Um, but presumably, if you have a private repo, you probably have more confidence in your connection from your site to that private repo than you would sort of um, random hosting to Drupal.org itself. Questions about the composer integration? Um, and then the other thing that we're working on is that Composer staged updates, the idea that um, we want to be able to safely update the site with as little downtime as possible. Um, basically, we want to copy the whole code base somewhere else, perform the Composer updates there, and then merge the changes back into the live site. Um, so an idea of what might happen is this on your left is your app, your app route without the Composer, without the staged update, and then when it needs to um, implement a stage update, it would sort of make a nested version of your site with the update um, and actually do all the updating there. So if something takes a long time or something breaks, your live site is fine. And then when it copies it over, it would kind of just merge everything back up above into, into your live site. So um, you could take the live site off for a very um, short period of time. So this is kind of, in a sense, this is kind of what the what the contrib module does for automatic updates. The one that's not composer aware, it does um, it does take the site only over offline for a brief amount of time, 
and it does the update in a staged way and it just brings the files, only the files that have changed over. Um, so an example of how you would run this from the command line would be do a composer stage begin and that would create like a temporary directory because it knows you're about to do a composer staged command. And then you do composer stage update. So that basically the composer stage just passes on whatever composer command you have into this staging directory instead of doing it directly into your regular um, app directory. And then composer commit would basically say move everything back over, maybe put the site into maintenance mode. Probably, probably Drupal core would call this itself and put it put put it into maintenance mode. And then finally, um, composer stage clean, which would remove. Um, you know your staged update once it's um, finished. Any questions? So this is something you could use outside of um, of uh, Drupal itself. It's not Drupal specific, and the PHP stuff stuff is also not Drupal specific. The only really uh, uh, specific part about the Composer integration with PHP Tough that's Drupal specific is the fact that somebody has to run a server repo of the update framework to sign everything. So you couldn't just say, well, I'm going to have my um, my special non Drupal app and I'm going to sign it with I'm going to make sure everything's um, signed correctly when I do composer updates with um, with with the PHP tough integration, unless there's some server somewhere signing stuff. So until somebody or Drupal.org provides that then um, you only have one half of the equation. Um, yeah, I wanted to back up for a second just to make sure that people actually understand, know what package signing is, because I'm not sure yeah. that everyone actually knows what that is or why it's important. Yeah, do you have a good explanation? Well, I just wanted to see if yeah, yeah. if anyone on the call had wasn't sure, because I mean, I, I'm not sure I even have a great explanation, but I, I could give it a shot. <laughs> um, and I mean, it's you know analogous, right? In 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 the way that like your browser connects to a website using um, so the web website um, right exposes a, a basically public key, um, and uh, when your browser tries to commit to website, the website basically is able to confirm that it's the owner of the public key by performing you know, some asymmetric cryptography, basically, um, right? And so that's why you have a, um, and for this system, um, it would be a little different. So Drupal core itself would actually ship with probably several different public keys that were basically, you know, in advance, we say, these, this is a trusted public key. And so in the system, like a public key allows you to verify the signature made by the private key, but in, um, is supposed to not allow you to make a new signature. Um, and so the the signature is basically um, a hash uh, of of the file content. So if people know about hashes, basically a hash is a nearly unique, short, relatively short string um, that can be generated from any length file or any length content. Um, and so the idea is you basically have a hash, which you can reproduce it by building your own hash to the file and making sure that the file um, has the correct integrity. So if the hash doesn't match, match then the file contents were changed, so it's the wrong file. Um, and then you can verify that the signature, which is kind of an, more or less another hash, um, was generated by the private key corresponding to the public key that you have been told to trust. So it's a way that um, the secret key is only basically within the Drupal.org infrastructure, but every Drupal site is able to verify that the software um, is the trusted software that came from that signed by the Drupal project. So I hope that made sense. But yeah, if people have questions because this that's really like fundamental to why why this stuff is important and why this is it sort of allows you to have trust that you're automatically updating to something that's not going to not itself going to hack your site. I think the other thing about that is the reason that um, 
uh, I guess the update framework was actually was chosen before I was involved, but the reason the people who chose it um, in the the Drupal pro, the Drupal initiative chose it was because it not only you know is a system for like making those public keys available is the 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 update framework assume has a system where it assumes you know private keys will be disclosed. Not obviously you don't want that to happen, but you want your update system to have a good plan if that happens. So um, when you uh, when you would start the update and you refresh the, the metadata from the server, it's going to say, hey, you know, these root keys or this this key on the say the target level that we told you is secure is actually no longer secure. Um, so you can provide new keys to say like, don't trust anything that was signed with that previous key because we had a hack and somebody got it. And so we're sending you it's a way to send new private keys. And so the idea is that um, is that it doesn't assume that like the private key system is like perfect and nobody you know, nobody will get access. It kind of assumes that, okay, if worst case scenario and somebody gets your keys or a key for a particular role that you've delegated, how can you how can you replace that? And how can you let the people, the clients know like, hey, okay, don't trust that anymore. We're gonna send you a new a new key, a new public key. Yeah. The other part about this is, so the Ted mentioned the contrib module that already exists and the contrib module does not use the update framework. It uses a different system of code signing. So the packages are signed securely, but it's not kind of a standardized system. Whereas this has been adopted by the Cloud Native Foundation, it's being used actually as the basis for how your car is going to get software updates. So you better be damn sure it it's secure. Um, and it, it is also complicated. Like this diagram is way more complicated than the thing that's used by the current contrib module. Um, but a value of that compl complexity is that it supports different workflows. So like some of the other projects uh, we were talking to, like Joomla or Typo3 want the developers and developers maybe to sign or pick their package. Whereas for the Drupal project, we might centralize that. So this update framework kind of supports both of those workflows, a workflow where the end developer might sign off on a particular package and push it up versus um, a kind of centralized build mechanism like Drupal.org has where only Drupal.org infrastructure would sign packages. So. Um, let's see here. Um, site readiness checks. This is something that we're just sort of starting. And this is the, I had talked about this before. Um, so the other thing to just close on, there's the proposed Drupal um, project browser, which a lot of people are excited about. Um, and so this, if you know, if you're interested in the, uh, you can already help with the project browser by helping with the automatic updates initiative, because ultimately the project browser, if it's going to securely um, you know, download new modules or updates to modules uh, for your site, it's going to need to also be secure. So hopefully we're probably going to use something like this um, for, or this will be the basis for the project browser. I mean, potentially the project browser could be launched without install um, ability, but just the ability to browse and find modules within Drupal. Um, but once we actually want it to browse, download, and install um, modules, then everything we've talked about for already as far as security, you're going to want that to be applied to your modules because, um, you know, updating to like a totally unknown module or a module that could be compromised is just as dangerous as updating Drupal core because once a module is installed, it can, you know, it could wipe out Drupal core and replace it with anything else. Um, because you know you're running its PHP, so um, this will hopefully be the basis for that. Um, but I don't think I don't think the project browser has to wait for automatic updates to 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 be done. But I, hopefully they'll sort of converge um, when automatic updates is done, and then when the project browser is like ready to actually do installs. Um, so if you want to learn more. Uh, these are actually things from DrupalCon, which hopefully they'll be available. I don't know when, but um, um, there's a video uh, from the tough uh, from the update framework maintainers 
did a session at DrupalCon. So when those videos are made available or if, or if you have a ticket to DrupalCon, maybe they're available to you now. Um, but the, this is like an overview of um, the update framework in a non Drupal specific way. Um, and then I had a technical overview now, which is kind of what um, we went over here, maybe, maybe in a little less detail actually than that. Um, and then we have the auto updates channel, uh, this Drupal contribution, that's probably not still there, but the Drupal Slack auto updates channel. Um, and we have a, um, every two weeks, there's a asynchronous meeting in auto updates. Um, so if you're there at the time it's going on, um, you can, you can participate, but also, uh, if you, if you just, you can comment after the fact, I think for like a day or something and people sort of try to pay attention to that. Um, if you want to find out what is going on with automatic updates, I think that is all I had. If people have questions. So I guess like. One one thing that comes to mind is like WordPress uh, has been doing this for quite some time. Don't use this update framework clearly. Yeah. Um, what do they do? Do they just sign it? Do they just sign it on WordPress.org and then have like some type of API that you know all uh, these websites read? You're so funny, Sean. Why? They don't they don't sign it at all. They don't sign it at all. It's just like, hey, here's an update. Hopefully yes. we don't break your website. Yeah. Um, so there was there was someone who, yeah had a compromise into the WordPress update system a year or two ago. I think they disclosed it and didn't actually use, use it to hack all the WordPress sites. But yeah, basically, um, someone could have hacked all the WordPress sites, um, basically. Um, yeah, and WordPress, I mean, as Ted mentioned, I mean, it, this doesn't apply to all Drupal sites because um, it's only going to work if you're PHP can basically write overwrite the code base itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, that's also a limitation of WordPress right now. So the WordPress updates rely on WordPress being able to write over its own code, which mm -hmm. in some situations is definitely insecure, but you know, it's kind of a trade off of, would you rather have up to date code or would you rather have code that can't write itself? It's right. um, so, but yeah, we're, I don't know in the long run, whether WordPress is going to add any kind of signing on top of their update system but yeah it's been going a long time and it it's i mean i think it's one of these things where where the drupal community kind of rejected that model just because of the high risk if someone compromised that system and you mm -hmm. compromise all the sites the all that would be so extreme for the project that you know um you'd have a really hard time yeah. ever getting people to recover it and wordpress they're just too know. big to fail it's gotten lucky or yeah or lucky. yeah yeah it could be just that they've gotten lucky i mean or we don't know about it right. well I, I think if somebody had like compromised their update system we would know about it right yeah there, there was a compromise yeah. of it and it was disclosed and they fit, i mean by someone who was not evil and disclosed it and they fixed it and that was i'll, I'll look for it but that was not that long ago it was a couple years ago yeah. um and we did have as we were at the starting process of this, yeah, we did meet with the head of the WordPress security team and talk about a lot of these challenges. So one of their their biggest challenges is actually volume, that they, there's so many WordPress sites out there mm. that actually just shipping the updates um, is a massive, massive problem. And you know, they have even if they have a very small percentage of them that go wrong, it's a lot of broken sites. So right. um, they've they've optimized for, for speed and reliability over security, basically. Mm -hmm. And do they, um, do they update plugins? They update everything. Yeah. Themes, okay. plugins. Yeah. And then, you know, you can configure it on your site, what you actually want. So like, just thinking like how your Drupal site, you know, everybody might turn on like, you know, massive security update, but you know, maybe for like feature releases, everybody will do it themselves. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure that they have metrics on how people actually use it. My guess is that most people are just, it's all or nothing. Yeah, I think unfortunately, I don't know, just I feel like in Drupal, we don't aren't good at getting metrics because we don't, you know, people aren't really interested in reporting back to Drupal.org their usage. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. We did have a question. Yeah, are you going to post the, 
that version of the slides or some version? Um, um, I will post um, the versions from, yeah, I'll post this version, sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and and maybe last question, Ted. So uh, from your standpoint, are there urgent things to be done? Like I've worked with Ted on the tough client in PHP. So that's, mm -hmm. I think, really approachable kind of for people that know PHP because it's basically just writing not super sophisticated code to implement the spec, um, a small subset of the spec, basically, just so you can yeah. verify that the things you got were correctly signed. It doesn't do yeah. the whole end to end so um, um yeah there's stuff in the php tough that's probably the most approachable um library um and we're, we did a lot of testing um so if anybody's interested um there's that we're, we have we do documentation there we need python expertise because basically since we're not implementing the server side in php only the python part to make our tests we basically need test fixtures which are um a test example of what a server side would look like um, and we're using the python code to create those so the python we are basically have a little script that makes all these test fixtures that we run our tests against so if anybody knows python we need help there uh, i think the people are working on it now me and uh adam are not really um python experts i'm learning python it's fun um but uh there's a lot of small stuff in the PHP tough library. And I think there's also probably because there haven't been a lot of eyes on it. I'm sure there's like a lot of small like formatting stuff and just stuff we're not consistent maybe with naming or whatever. We definitely fixed a lot of um, sort of that inconsistency stuff at DrupalCon. We had some good help from people who got involved in the sprint. Um, so yeah, just if you're interested and there's more start, there's starting to be more, there's two, two sort of important core issues for the auto updates module right now. Um, and then there's also a lot of issues for um, uh, the update module because like somebody was asking about like being able to find find the updates for you in the API. We're trying to clean up the update module so that we don't um, inherit a lot of the technical debt when we start using it in the auto updates module. So um, we're working on that there too. Well, thank you, Ted, for coming yep. and uh, presenting yep. on this. And we look Thanks forward for to seeing how things go. Yep. Thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's great. Definitely. It's always good to hear people like talk about the technical things, right? To like hear it be put into like conversation like that. So yeah. it's really nice. I'm going to stick around, but at some point I'm going to have to go out my, we have a book club that we do that happens to be on the same night. My wife's already, I'm, I'm glad our, my Zoom's not cutting out because I think my wife is on, <laughs> on the Zoom for the book club now, but I'll stick around for a little longer. All right, good. All right. So do we, we want to do questions or I know, yeah, Ian's here now and had. Yeah, we had a whole bunch of questions. So let me do like a couple questions. Ian, maybe you can give us a quick recap and then we'll do a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm okay. going to be very quick. So, okay. Uh, so, um, I will be I will be not uh, I will be not selfish and will not answer ask my question first. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead, Sean. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, so, Leora had a question about hosting an email setup. It sounded like we got most of that resolved. In the yeah. Well, actually, panel. the main question is is one that I've had for many, many, many years. <laughs> And I've never gotten a straight answer. So, um, cause I had a bad experience. Like mm -hmm. I think when I started doing a uh, web hosting a long time ago with separating email from um, web hosting and having it doing the right pointers. And I can't find, mm -hmm. so like, so I set it up. I have this kind of, I would call it a dummy domain that I'm using because it might become something and it might not. Mm -hmm. So I pointed it to, um, to Zoho. But um, like I want it, it's sort of a test trial because I want to move my own stuff, which is a motley of mm -hmm. WordPress and PHP files and other things. So um, 
the, the point is, is that the suggestion is to use the C panel mm -hmm. inside A2, but I want to eventually switch away from A2. And my understanding is that there's no um, C panel in um, digital ocean. That's, that's what I was told that, that why, I, I can't. Why do you need C panel? Um, well, I'm just trying to fit C panel. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Okay. So I have, let's say I set up, um, I have these name servers and what I'm used to is you point the name servers to the web host. That's what mm -hmm. I'm used to. And then I guess you could change the MX records, but I don't want to yeah. use this web host. Eventually I want to switch the email first and test it out. And I, but I want to do the switching on Namecheap, which is where my domain is. Yeah, so I, did you delegate the DNS from Namecheap to your host? Delegate. Yeah. What do you mean by so delegate? like in Namecheap, you can manage your DNS records directly in Namecheap, or you could have delegated and assigned the name servers to be the web host's name servers. So if like you change a DNS record, do you go to cPanel or do you go to Namecheap? Um, well, okay, so they have, I know how it went in, I have the name servers pointed toward um, A2 for my main do domain, but for this kind of dummy one, I have it for basic DNS. Right. Which, which is like name cheap DNS. Yes. So that's kind of what I want to do for right. mine so that my email can be on Zoho and my site can stay on A2 for now. Right, yep. So, what, how do I, I mean, there's things like C names and there's A records and I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to do. Um, well, so, right, so the- I mean, I could do this on Zoho. Well, so for email, it's the MX records. Right. So that, it sounds like you've already investigated or gotten working. Right, but I think, what was the issue? Oh, the issue is, is what's, if I want to move my own, the way I got that working, was that I switched to basic DNS. Yeah. Which was fine because I'm not using, I'm not using any web hosting for that. Like it's right. the PC. So if you wanted to use web hosting, there's there's a few different possibilities. Typically the web host would either give you an IP address or they would give you a host name to use as a C name. And so then you would go into the basic, basic DNS. So, and if they said like, your website will be served from the following IP address, like a typical shared host would probably just have one IP address. Um, and they tell you the host you're hosted on uses this IP address. Um, and you would create an A record um, and maybe a whatever AA record for the IPv6 version. Okay. Um, okay. And you would point, <laughs> point them to their IP address on their server that's serving your website. Um, okay, so let's, let's say it's so my, my um, the one right now that points, the name servers are pointing to A2, but sure. I want to take that email and move it to Zoho. Right. So in- What do I, I need mean, to change? But I'm, well, keeping, I'm keeping the, the name servers pointing to, to uh, but I don't want to use- Well, so then if you're keeping the name servers pointed to A2, then you have to make all the DNS changes in A2. Right. So you in that was A2, what I want to avoid because I, I, I want it done and then I don't have to change it later because then later nope. on I'll have to. Nope. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I mean, I would just do it in Namecheap and then have your C name or A records or whatever point at A2. Right. That's and then what I was switch thinking. it to DigitalOcean when the time comes. Yeah. Right? So, so if you want to do it only once, right, you have to switch the name servers back off of A2, but your website might go down for a day. Which nobody looks at it anyway. And, and it's actually better that they don't look at it because then fewer recruiters will contact me since I'm not really looking right now. <laughs> okay, so so yeah, the problem with delegating I your see, name servers I is- a day that, where my website goes down. Okay, this is- Right, so basically, yeah, if you've delegated the name servers and you want to put the name server, pick different name servers basically, right? Yeah. And it could be it could be Namecheap or you could use a different DNS service you could pass it to Cloudflare and let Cloudflare do all your DNS and use it that yeah. way. Yeah, so there's lots of, okay. there so are other the people. Possibilities are like Cloudflare, Cloudflare or? Or I, I don't even know, OpenDNS yeah. maybe still does okay. it. I, I don't know, there's like a- More, more research a, needs to get done, okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of people, right? So if you only ever want to change it once, it, it, I mean, but if this is your own personal site, it probably doesn't matter and Namecheap's basic DNS is probably fine. 
Right. Um, but basically the process would I'm be right. I'm to learn also. It's sort of, you right. know, it's also a, a learning, a learning right. thing. So basically when you're moving it back to quote unquote basic DNS basically just means you're saying the name cheap name servers are the ones to use and not the A2 name servers. Okay. So then I need to figure out how to point to A2. Right. Using, is it an, an A name, an A record or a C name? Which, how do I point to? Well, it depends. Well, like what is the name of your web? What's the URL of your website? LeoraW.com. L-E-O-R-A-W. Um, That's it. Back when I used to do that stuff. So that, is it www or just the plain host name? I, I think it can be either. Right. So those are both served by IP address 75, 98, 175, 101. Uh-huh. Which How did you get that so quickly? But okay. I just ran the host command on my Oh, phone. okay. Right. <laughs> um, so probably if you went in A2 control panel and you looked around, it would tell you that that's the IP address to use somewhere in, in the AT control panel uh -huh. or in, or in your yeah I know I, I think it's in um it, it tells you in the C panel yeah so basically that so that's um I don't know if there's an IPv6 also but you would basically set an A record and just say like um you know that Leora w.com and www.leoraw the com, you would make an A record for each of those and give it that okay, IP address. For both. Okay. Yeah. Um, people often now don't, moving away from serving websites on bare domains, but you know, you can, you can leave it as is for now. Um, and then, yeah, then you could just set up the MX rec records that you want. And once the names, once everyone realizes that, I mean, your website actually probably wouldn't be down for that long. It's just because you're actually you putting back the same record. So mm -hmm. sometimes people will get the answer from A2 and sometimes people get the answer from Namecheap. Right, right, right. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. And so after a day or so, everyone will start getting the answer from Namecheap. Okay. The answer, right. the answer being the IP address corresponding I find to I that do answer. these things and then I have questions halfway <laughs> through and I'm like, who do I ask? But well, you can ask in Slack. Someone I'll might ask in Slack. Yeah. <laughs> there might be an MX record to worry about too. Not that she wants more spam. Right. Yeah. The, I mean, the MX yeah, record no, that's I, there I'll now. I'll set is... up the right. The MX records should go to Zoho event. You know, I that. Yeah. The... Do I want to do that first because I know I want to use them. Right. That's right now, there's just a single MX take, record. I have to figure out migrate all my old email. Right. Because that's useful. The old email yeah. is actually useful. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think Zoho email was pretty easy to set up. We used it. I said it during for the camp stuff for a while. Mm -hmm. But again, I think we just had bare DNS managed by name. Yeah, no, I looked at the, the price yeah. for the, the lowest is fine. And, and I think I can get what I need with the, um, the, the, fir the first tier of pricing. Yep. I like to pay anyway, because I feel more like I'd much rather be somebody's customer. Good point. Um, yeah. Now I, I've too, too, I don't Facebook is a, is a good experience in why um, you're, we're not their customer. So <laughs> good point. they don't care about us. So anyway, one problem solved in theory. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. That, that yeah. it's, moves me forward. Yeah. I'm still nervous about actually doing it because I, I asked this question before, but one day it'll I'll be get fine. It'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. More email problems from Levi. How to troubleshoot a partial email failure in Drupal 7. So are you on yeah. a production site and the emails just sometimes go, sometimes don't? Correct. Um, so yeah, so to give you some context, it's a Drupal 7 site that they have decided to migrate to WordPress. Um, well, generally they've decided to migrate to WordPress. So we're all kind of just like trying to keep this thing going until they pull the plug and go somewhere else, right? So um, everyone's motivation is not the highest, including my own, I will admit. Um, I saw so it's a Drupal 7 site that's running on PHP 5.6. That is, um, so that's the first thing. Um, they, the emails are automated uh, through an external SMTP service, I think it's SendGrid, um, using rules. So people mm -hmm. will get 
you know, automated emails before, you know, the day before you're the thing that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Those are working. Um, when they check out through the process to buy a ticket, the email that gets sent out to, again, through rules um, to send out the invoice is failing. Um, but if they go, if the site administrators go into the back end the, uh, and say, send an email to whoever, that one works. Um, so all these things kind of like through rules and through mm -hmm. uh, Drupal Commerce, some work, some don't. Uh, and interestingly enough, the forgot password email is not working out of Drupal core. That one's getting the same error. So my question is, is just what, what are some suggestions on like where I go to debug this? Uh, so I've looked at DB log, DB log just says couldn't send the email. Right. And I'm not getting any like specific. So yeah, I, I've dealt with rules and email far too much. <laughs> so the first thing I would say is look at mail log. I don't know if you did that yet that will at least log yeah. all the mail yeah. actions that are happening right so like okay um you can see like oh email got sent to this person and this is what it was before it goes to send grid um okay because obviously in the send grid dashboard you can kind of find it but if it never gets to send grid it's kind of useless and i guess that's probably where the issue is happening right drupal is either, like either not yeah. sending the email at all or for some reason drupal and send grid aren't happy with each other um, right yep yep and then the other thing I would look at is the rules configuration. Sounds like it's probably the culprit, maybe. Um, I yeah, know rules can the, be very it's finicky. The unable about to, yeah, that was my first thought too. But then the the unable to send the password reset email is what through, right? Because that shouldn't be coming out of rules. That's just core Drupal. Well, and look at yeah. what um, email sends the emails in different scenarios. I mean, yeah, okay. that's what I was thinking because it's configurable. Right. You can yeah. you can set up different like mail handlers. I forget mm -hmm. what mail, module yeah, I, think I they're used. called mail systems. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mail systems. And then you can so you can end up setting one to use one kind of mail system and a different thing to use a different mail system. So that would that would be what I would check. Yeah, okay. and I All mean right. you don't have to use a UI to configure that. So you might just dig into that API in Drupal 7 and just see if that has things configured. Cause yeah, that right there, it could be like someone decided mm -hmm. that the password e reset email should use SMTP email and other emails should use SendGrid mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. right? And that right. might be why that one fails. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that you yeah, have a password okay. reset one to fail is kind of convenient cause that's probably really easy to reproduce. Yeah, um, yeah. You could you know, put in more debugging around that if you had to. Um, okay. Do you know anything how getting... SendGrid is integrated? Is it the API or is it SMTP? Unfortunately, I didn't do it. Okay. So it's, it's something I've inherited. Yeah. yeah. So I would check the SendGrid. I would check the settings. If it's using SMTP, I know for a fact that they deprecated something a couple months ago, which may still actually be on, but like maybe there's some like weirdness there where you need to use the API key instead of the username and password that used to be the authentication method. Um, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Because I literally had to update every client site to use the API key instead of the username password, which was the old way of doing it. Um, and then they have an API oh, okay. version of dealing with it versus SMTP. So there's like more than one way of integrating it. So, you know, it, it, Again, it sounds like you know something is misconfigured somewhere along the lines. Um, right. Yeah. If you use and that mail log module, at least you'll be able to say like, "Oh, Drupal sending the password email, but it's never getting to SendGrid. So why is it never getting to SendGrid?" And try to troubleshoot it from there. You Make know? sure it's okay. not okay. caught that up any spam folders or anything too. Right. So it actually yeah, gets no, out, good, but it doesn't. Question. Right. But yeah. In this case, it. we're getting a, we're getting an error on Drupal itself saying unable to send the email. Mm -hmm. right. So but it's not Drupal an error coming from SendGrid. It's yeah. a Drupal error, right? It's a Drupal error, right? Yeah. It's like so, within like the you know like Drupal print message screen, little uh, that little pop up right. thing. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. yeah I wonder also if it's not at, like yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, where that's coming from? Because I would almost think if it's trying to send to SendGrid, it might not do that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Like look at where that. My first thought from. was old PHP. That didn't work. I upgraded to seven point three, and that didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and then like okay. Ka like Kathy said, the the email like account that can send the emails, that's configurable in the Drupal site, but it's also configurable in the SendGrid side. So if somebody can yeah. technically hijack it, right? So if like those two things mismatch for some reason, like uh, argument's sake, you know, um, the email for the invoice comes from, you know, you know, client at invoices dot their domain name instead of just their bare domain name. Right, like it's so oh, okay. stupid as that point. could could fail the thing, um, in that right. instance at least. Oh yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think it's look at look at mail log because at least it'll maybe give you some more like insight to the Drupal side of things. If you can say like, okay, everything seems to be wrong on the SendGrid side, then you know you can debug it over there further. Right, right. Okay, that's super helpful. All right, that helps me a lot. Thank you. I appreciate yep. it. And then feel free to ping us in Slack when you're ripping your hair out. Yeah, will do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's next week. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ian, you want to give us a quick rundown in DrupalCon? No, because I've lost the doc. <laughs> give me a second. Somebody oh, man. Else. All right. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm now, I'm now I'm going to do my question real quick. Uh, so hopefully somebody has an answer for this or, or could tell me that I'm crazy and don't do that. Um, so I'm migrating a site. Um, the way I've done it so far is I've kept the node IDs um, so that the you know canonical URLs still you know go where they were going before uh, in case they were shared out or some weird other random things that are going on. Um, and I have some new content that I need to make, but I don't want it to conflict with my incremental migrations over the next month or so where new content is going to come over from the existing D7 site. So my thought was, do I, is there a way where I can like basically programmatically create a node and say, node, I want you to be ID 9,000. And so that the next one I automatically, the next one I manually create is 9,001, 9,002, 9,003 or whatever it is, right? But that gets me around the, you know, upper limit of how much content the client will create between yeah. now and next month. Does that this is what we right? did for BioRaft. Yeah, I remember you saying something about mm -hmm. this or somebody saying something about this at one point. Yeah, I just posted the example of the code in Slack. And awesome. here I'll, I'll share a screen if you want me to share sure. also. Cool. Um, if people can, let's see, I'm not allowed to share, but. You should be, I stopped. No, oh, share screen, okay. Uh, okay. Um, so this is definitely not, I mean, not beautiful code, but it works. Um, and we had exactly this problem, even more so that we have ongoing new content being created over potentially the span of years, which is why you, these numbers look large. Um, <laughs> so that, yeah. Um, so, you know, that we potentially have literally years of new content being created in the old site that's, that is incrementally migrated to the new site. And we're also creating new content on the new site. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think just a couple tricks in here. User IDs, you might also want to worry about, and the user IDs don't work the same way as node IDs. That's not a problem for me. So okay. that, that one's easy. But still worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. This was the, I don't know, this could be my fault. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that was my fault. Totally my fault. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, basically just create when we install like a module that's always installed when we turn on the site, we, in the install hook, create a node and, uh, the node API actually doesn't care if you use a node type that is totally non-existent. I mean, you could use an existing node type, but whatever, whatever. I mean, you could use like, if you have something dummy, like the page node type, you could use that or use any random string. I think you can even delete this node once you even either even right either right away possibly or after, after you create you some content for sure. But okay. it doesn't matter a lot. Um, it's not going to show up in any of your views because it's a non-existent node type. Yeah. Um, so basically the one trick here is make sure you pick a revision ID. You might want to pick a revision ID that's larger than the node ID because your old mm -hmm. site might have run the revision IDs up much higher than they did the node IDs. Yeah, for sure that's the case. So 
I would say that would be the main thing to look at and don't naively assume that you should, unless you go way, way higher than you currently are, don't necessarily assume that setting the node ID and the revision ID to be the same thing or is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I made it unpublished too, right? So yep. no one's ever going to see it. Hey, Peter, cool. yeah. you, went with, you went with this sort of implements hook, which you're going, going to have to get rid of or something at some point or remove. Have you just considered going into the database and um, is it, isn't there an index? There should be an index value. And if you were to set that higher to your 2,000, 8,000, you might just be done anyhow and never have the dummy input value. Yeah, I mean, look, you could go straight to the database and figure out which table has mm -hmm. the auto increment offset. Uh, the, uh, yeah, are they? That increments? would automatically be in the, the node table, presumably, and the version table would have one too. Mm -hmm. Right. So you probably have to figure out which two different tables you needed to go make a query against and set. And yeah, you could certainly do that too. This is just like, if I do this, the node module knows where to write the data, and then I'm all set. Mm -hmm. So. And it, it's been fine for the last, whatever, four years. So is that sequences thing only for, is that for the node or is that for users based on that? That's comment? for users and maybe some, I forget something else. Yeah, I only see one thing in that table right now in the in the Drupal 9 version of this database. So I'm like, it's, that seems... it's yeah, definitely users and whether, Feel like there's something else that Drupal Core uses, but it's not. It's not. Con it's not that common. Okay. So. Yeah, like my number is like not even close to the number of node IDs in this system. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know offhand of a more elegant solution because mm -hmm. it yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, nice this is kind of where I was thinking about, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just like, you know, worry about like people having shared things or like it sitting in Twitter and for whatever reason, it's the node ID and not the thing. Or the other fun thing is like they linked it in content and it's actually the node ID and not a path that I have to write yeah. direct for, which is my preferred way of doing it anyway, so that they don't break and people change the paths um, with linked module. So this is helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ian, have you found your spreadsheet? Yes, I have. So All right. It's a, a Google Doc that I am not going to share because uh, it's just jottings. Um, so I'll paste a link to the sessions and um, talk about DrupalCon 2021. So I attended on a scholarship because there are not enough old white guys in the Drupal community. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I actually got... <coughs> I didn't originally apply, but they um, they said they didn't have enough applicants. So I applied on the basis that I was out of work, hint, hint, and um, had been out of the community for about four years. Um, so I got one. And I know someone else who got one. So it seems like... Yeah. So people should totally tell other people to apply exactly. for mm -hmm. things. Like, ask for them. You'd be surprised what, what people will help you out with. I was, and so was the other person who I told you. They wanted you back. Uh, yes, <laughs> they don't know me. Um, so then my next section is the highlights. And for me, the absolute highlight was the closing session with uh, this guy called Stu Karoff somewhere in the Midwest who has a program called Linux Pe Ping Penguins. And it's uh, he's a teacher and he has a computer club and they refurbish computers for other kids that need them. And what was impressive about it was just the chat went berserk. Um, it was just exploding with people. There was just the, the enthusiasm about the project was just amazing. Um, the only mistake they made was they didn't have merchandise and they didn't ask for money. They would have made <laughs> a fortune. Um, uh, but it was great. The kids uh, did individual presentations. The whole thing was about maybe 20 minutes long. And there was maybe six or seven kids, each one of of whom took a section and they were all just great. It was really good. Uh, another do you, have a link, do you have a link to that? Uh, I don't actually know if they put it in the actual link that they gave me for the sessions, but I'll see if I can find it. Okay, let me put the link to the sessions in the chat. If I can find the chat. Uh, okay. Um, I met some of those kids a couple of years ago. 
Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. they came to the uh, Drupal Camp, uh, Twin Cities Drupal Camp in uh, mm. Minnesota. Yeah. And it's just so inspiring. Ian's oh, right. It's just it's just a great a great thing. Oh yeah, fabulous. So these are the PDFs. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. What about the videos? They're on. You're so demanding, Peter. Okay, I will. Well, I'm trying to remember. Like I, I, I thought I saw an email where they might have said you still had to log in to get the videos or something. Yeah, I'm not sure if they released the videos yet, but I, I will go look at some point tomorrow. Okay. You know I'm demanding, Ian. You <laughs> um, said you know I'm demanding. I heard that. Yeah. Uh, another big highlight for me was Amy June won the uh, Aaron Winborn Award, which was mm -hmm. fabulous, um, well deserved. Um, a third highlight was all but one of the major COVID-19 vaccine companies uh, use Drupal. I don't know who the exception is, but everybody else is using Drupal. Um, those we can find out. Let's do it. Let's find out. I'll take J&J off that list. Yep, that's one. All right. Cool. I'm, I'm pretty sure Pfizer, Pfizer does uses, it. Yeah, Pfizer, Pfizer definitely. uses Drupal, yeah. What? Pfizer definitely uses Drupal. Yeah. Maybe Moderna or AstraZeneca. Yeah, uh, Pfizer doesn't only use Drupal. Pfizer like pays people to work on Drupal, don't they? At some point they did. I think maybe not around anymore. The, around the content staging stuff, that was yeah. a big push. They had, a whole, they had a whole Moderna Drupal Seven site. <laughs> Come on, upgrade, upgrade. So <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Drupal Seven's fine. It's gonna get security <laughs> updates for another three years or so. Really? It's gonna be automatic. No. No, one yes, year. it will. No, no, there's lots oh, of Oh, well, you could get extended support, maybe. Yeah. So, is that going to be paid support? Yeah. Okay. No, that's not true. Well, the, I mean, the, the patches will be publicly available, probably. Yes, the patches will be public available yes. at the same time for the general public as for anybody who pays for extended support. And they will come out for approximately three more years and who's who's going to be publishing them the pay, who are the these paid support people um there's multiple companies that have signed up um maybe you'll find them acquia is probably one of them yeah acquia pantheon my drop wizard okay cool. the, the ones the same ones who did the six for the most part yeah and i think even did. more than did drupal six so yeah. well cool yeah so the low light i may have invented this word was hop in which was a complete blight upon my experience <laughs> <laughs> every day the chat was just again bombarded with people saying when where is my session so it, it required constant moderation people i'm um, just constantly mm. repeating your session will appear five minutes before it starts mm. i don't understand why this has not been fixed do hop and consider this a feature it really <laughs> boggles my mind that this is still going on yeah, it, it was kind of bad. There, people were sharing in Slack like a secret list of session direct links so you could get there. If like you were, so the speakers could uh, could find out like where their session was in advance and get there in time. <laughs> it was, it, yeah. I, I only attended a little bit, but yeah, it was not. I was not impressed. No, I mean, I know they were under a lot of pressure to pull it together. Um, I mean, they used this last year though. Like you know, I mean, did they use did they use this for did we have Europe last year or no? I think the, Europe yeah, I don't think they used it for the Europe one. The Europe they, one is using something else. Yeah, but they used this for the the global thing, right? Like, and that was yeah. like really hopping in its in its infancy. Mm. Like that was like really early days. So it's like a year later. Like you would think it would not be, you know, bad. I I, I mean I've used Hopin for other things, or I've seen been parts of Hopin things for other things. I I don't think I had the same experience. Probably because there was a substantially less content, mm. right? So like there was only like two or three sessions, and not like seventy-five billion sessions to go to at any given point in time. So yeah. maybe that's the issue. Yeah, another problem was they used multiple um, products. There was hop in for the sessions. There was something else for the contrib, and there was something else. For oh yeah, the contrib thing, whatever that was, was also pretty wonky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was just there was no fluid UI experience. Mm -hmm. Everything worked slightly different, so it was it was pretty jagged, pretty lumpy. Yeah, everybody was pretty 
calm about it except me. Uh, so <laughs> I, I grumbled and then everybody agreed with me. We know how you're raging. Yeah, yeah, I ranted. <laughs> um, uh, so midlights, um, so in, in between the, whole, the highs and the lows, was um, I was very interested in accessibility. It, it was huge. There was just so many presentations on, on accessibility. Um, I'm also saying this in the WordPress community because I've been flirting with WordPress folks. Um, but sidetrack on WordPress, I'm done with them. It's not them, it's me. Um, they're, they're a really nice community, possibly even nicer than the Drupal community. My theory is because they share so much pain. I just cannot believe like 56,000 plugins, daily security updates, everything that you want, anything serious you want to do, you have to buy a, a plugin. Um, everybody's reinventing the wheel. Mm -hmm. daily and what really makes me smile is they think drupal is too complex and difficult um i just uh, well people love spending money to solve their problems i mean that's 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 part of the drupal problem is like people who are building things like web four module you know sustaining mm -hmm. that is is a problem because we don't have that other model there's not this like uh you know, freemium, premium kind of model in the Drupal ecosystem, really. There's a, a handful of things, but not much. Yeah. And that kind of segues on. has to make money, right? So in the Drupal world, you get paid by these big companies or big government or big universities. And mm. that, that small people don't use Drupal because the cost, the, the developers mm -hmm. cost too much. Whereas WordPress is easier to throw together, but then these little developers need to get paid. So they, mm -hmm. you know, Whatever. Yeah, but they're constantly also having to pay for, you know, plugins too. Yeah, um, I don't know. I find if I if with WordPress, because if I keep it really simple, because I just want to do blogging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, but I mean, there are people. Whatever. Doing... I just have to make sure the the darn thing stays alive. <laughs> yeah, but there are people doing stuff that I would have thought was too complex for WordPress. You know, they're doing e-commerce projects. Oh, oh e-commerce is huge in WordPress. <laughs> I don't know, WordPress, they have a lot of e-commerce. It's like WooCommerce, it's like yeah. big. I keep hearing that. Um, but I, and I heard of somebody who's running an airport, a major international airport using WordPress, which just blows my mind. But anyway, like back, on, back on, <laughs> on a kind of well, a repeated What note. blows my mind is they're both running on PHP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's probably well, so headless. It's, Facebook, it's gotta right? be headless at this point. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Facebook is still running on PHP more or less, right? right. Yeah. Um, so back on the Drupal track, um, I kind of stumbled across, um, a, I guess it was uh, some kind of bird of a feather conversation. Jacob uh, Rokovitz, I think his name is, he's the mm -hmm. web form maintainer. And he was just talking about how he can no longer afford to support that module for free. And they were having just a conversation in general about how this has become becoming problematic. Um, what I got out of it, it seems like Drupal devs are getting older and Drupal's no longer the bright, shiny object. Um, so we're not attracting, you know, younger developers. Um, and I'm wondering what the future of, of free contributed support is. Are we going to end up with a, with a, a, a more WordPress like model, which is where Jacob seems to be heading. Um, and you can't really blame him. Mm -hmm. you know, he's got to eat too. Um, well, and his his primary business isn't going to be using Drupal anymore. I think that's a big change in the yeah, that it right right. I've been following his uh, blog post pretty. Um, well, he's where was he with MSKCC? Uh, yeah, he was at least. Yeah, I think that's where he is. Yeah, but that's kind of they were like a flagship Drupal eight site, right? Like very early on. And so they're yeah. moving to Sitecore or something. I don't know what they're moving to. They're moving to something else. Mm. Yeah, well, you know. It happens. It comes and goes. Yeah. Let me just say, a lot of people are moving off of Drupal onto something else and then moving back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Because it just seems to me like what happens is like a new CTO joins a company and they're like, how much are you spending on this? This is ridiculous. Yeah. We need to switch to a cheaper option. 
Mm -hmm. And then they try and switch to the cheaper option and it costs them way much more money. Mm -hmm. And then another new CTO comes in and says, what is happening here? (laughs) So, I mean, I know that like a lot of sites that are on Drupal 7 are faced with a very expensive move to something. Mm -hmm. and so they're using that as an opportunity to move to something else but also i think you know there are drupal still has strengths and Mm -hmm. there will be people that come back once they've tried other things i know i i absolutely agree with that i'm a my take on it is this whole bright shiny object thing people don't think Drupal is cool anymore, but I don't care about cool. I, I want stuff. I used to work for Xerox and our mantra was, we just want shit that works. Um, <laughs> that, was our, that was our primary focus because we were dealing with a company that was giving us shit that didn't work on a nightly build basis. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't care about bright, shiny objects. I just care about stuff that works. And I think Drupal works and will continue to be mm-hmm. the best option for a lot of people. And it's uh, just a job, right? And Mm -hmm. kids want to make money just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And when the kids find out how much it pays, Mm. you know, they'll want to do it. It's Mm. not like, it's not like people need to be inspired. Like, (laughs) oh my gosh, I'm just in love with Python. This is the most beautiful poetry. And no, they just want a paycheck. They want to write some code and make a good living and have a band on the side and also bake cake with their mm-hmm. friends. Like young kids, just they just want a job and they know it's good work. I don't think we need to like entice them. But if that's true, why is everybody so excited about React and Gatsby and all that? I, to me, that's just, okay, I'm sure it's a little bit faster and I'm sure it's fun and I'm sure it's exciting, but does it really make the user experience so much better that it's worth all of this? You, you'll, you don't need to be a polyglot, really. I mean, if you know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, those are your three languages. Or mm-hmm. What do you call those things? Yeah. Some of those things, languages, right? You don't need to know PHP. You don't need to know Python. You don't need to know, you know X, Y, Z. You just need to know JavaScript. And that's the allure of it, is that if I can write everything in JavaScript, my front end, my back end, my server, why would I want to have why would I want to know five different languages to be able to do the same thing? That's, that's the attractiveness of it, I think. But how many people are writing front end, back end, DevOps? I mean, in JavaScript, it's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Not, not, in, not in like PHP land, but in JavaScript, there's a lot of them are full stack. I mean, even, yeah. even parts of WordPress are React, right? Like the whole Gutenberg thing is React. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, and WordPress has a very good decoupled, you know, model, right? They've had a REST API for longer than Drupal's had like a core REST API. They have, you know, WordPress GraphQL, right? So like, you know, they're 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 fine with you still using WordPress as your backend because everybody's comfortable with it. And if you want to do the shiny new thing and, and not use PHP on the front end, go for it, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I think, you know, that's that's where the innovation in, you know, stuff's going to be. It's going to be the front end side of things. But of course, all yeah, of these frameworks yeah. are now going server side too. So <laughs> even React's going right. to go server side. So it's it, like at some point, like, you know, it, it'll just eat PHP. I mean, it's the, is the way it, it may trend, right? Is that, you know, rather than, you know, writing part of your application in PHP and the you know, other part in JavaScript, you'll just write everything in JavaScript. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. If you look at like um, West Bosses, if, if you ever listen to like syntax, so for those of you who don't know, West Bosses is like a pretty big JavaScript guy, um, but has a background in PHP as well. Um, and his his like ongoing joke is JavaScript is just we're just rewriting PHP. Like it's just going to be PHP eventually, right? Um, no, I I totally agree. And to answer your qu- question, Ian, like I think that React solves a couple like narrow cases that, or at least does it in a slightly different way that people find interesting, like. Um, it, it, there are narrow use cases and knowing like about all of these different things helps you to be able to like solve for those narrow use cases in potentially a slightly more optimized way. But is it a requirement? No. Um, I, I spent the last six months 
learning it just because I thought it was a giant hole in my own, my own abilities, right? Like JavaScript was just a thing I wasn't very good at. Um, and honestly, like it made me a better PHP developer to learn that stuff. Um, so I think that, I think that, um, you know, I, but I am not of the opinion that these, that these things should be replacing Drupal anytime soon. I just think that they kind of like have these little slices. They all sort of like broadly fall into and there's overlap, but you know, sometimes there are arguments for using any one over the other in, in certain situations that might be exact. So I just it's shared very, something. Very, very great. I just shared something here. This this um, uh, framework thing big, built on React called Remix. The two guys and kind of core in the React community, not core, core of React, but like high profile in the React community are working yeah. on. And there's an interesting video there. And basically, they ba they basically get back to writing things the way you would write HTML back in the day. Like, oh, you have a form you write form, you write post, right? Like you don't, it's not like all this crazy abstraction that React had built into this stuff. Eventually it's gonna get back to the basics because the basics are still what you're using under the hood, right? So I think, you know, long-term, you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are a very, you know, strong horse to bet on, right? As the skills you, you should know. If you're not gonna be, you know, building websites and you're going to be maintaining servers even javascript is still you know going to be that you know javascript and python and stuff like that are going to be more so your languages than php is ever going to be right all right yeah i mean i, I guess one way to look at it also though is like if you use something like drupal as a content repository or any kind of content repository right that is something you want to be stable and longer live potentially than the front end i feel mm -hmm. like Mm. upside and downside of the javascript stuff right is you kind of are continuously right. needing to change it or update it or revamp it um and you know there there's a lot of cost to that if that's kind of on the server side um in part because that's where you need stability like if there's a front end front end bug you know is maybe like really easy to fix if you have back end bug and you bork your data mm -hmm. you know you might never recover so well it's funny that we have like you know I don't know, two dozen different pay for CMS backend only kind of companies that exist, right? Yeah. When, you know, you could, you know, get everything you need from a Drupal. I mean, I think that that should be Drupal's story or at least a very strong part of its story is like, you know, are you using Sandy or using Forestry or using any of these other, you know, CMS, you know, API CMS things. You know, if Drupal had a good enough story and you could do it yourself and the cost of that was just substantially less and it felt good, right? Like the Claro theme and things like that that are making it feel more modern. You know, mm -hmm. I think that'll make that, that, that story a lot more compelling to people to adopt Drupal as part so, of their stack. So we need Drupal headless gardens? <laughs> yeah. And I think you, there's a major proposal for Acquia there. Yeah. Drupal, there are, Drupal gardens, but only, only headless. Project Nurse Shark. <laughs> so I have a question well, for even you. If, oh, go ahead. go ahead, Pana. Sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, Levi. Well, I was just gonna say, remember CSS Gardens? Like when it was like take the exact same content and style it a bunch mm -hmm. of different ways. Like you could do that with Drupal. Like have the exact same back end and put a like four or five gazillion different front ends on it and just, I mean, style it in different ways. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. But like it would also be different JS front ends. I don't know. Uh, the Contenta project did that. So the mm -hmm. Contenta is like a decouple distribution um, and they had a bunch of different uh, front ends for it um, like in React and Angular and I forget what else iconic um, but yeah I would really be interested there I don't they didn't really get much movement behind it but it'd be great if Drupal shipped with a with a sort of decoupled first uh, mm -hmm. install profile where you kind of turn off a lot of the stuff you might not need mm -hmm. and you turn on JSON API, but I think probably to make that really viable, probably more. For, I don't know if just what Core has would it would be good enough, um, but Contenta was kind of yeah one stab at that. Yeah, I mean you're going to end up needing. I mean a lot of these things like GraphQL, right? So like maybe that's the other missing component, you know, for a lot of these new newer shiny object front end things is that the ability to just have the GraphQL API you know, GraphQL module and core at some point. Is that 
What I thought are you was... speaking, Sean? Really? <laughs> why? Why not? I mean, I don't know why not. I'm just, I'm powers, just asking. You, I'm just Facebook. asking if you're serious. Are you yeah. making a joke? Or are no, you I'm, no, I'm not making a joke. No, that was that was that was a serious comment from a from a serious person. I th- okay. I, I thought some of the JavaScript frameworks already knew how to like wrap JSON API and make it look so you re- like you're writing um, GraphQL queries. There is something like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I don't. Yeah, I guess I was curious if it was even needed. Um, I just think from a from a ability to kind of put different bits of data together piece, right? You're like your GraphQL endpoint could be more than just the Drupal thing too, right? So like there's mm-hmm. like this kind of reconciliation bit about it. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, that would kind of be nice. Right, and I think but, like if you want to use Drupal as a backend for Gatsby, you have to turn on GraphQL. You have to yeah. install the, you know, you can't get it with JSON API, you know, because oh, I thought it used to work uh, with JSON API. I don't no? think so. I think it's the GraphQL module. Hmm. Uh, that's a question for Hazy's. We'll have to okay. pay him. But... So it sounds like we need someone to give a talk about what GraphQL is. So, I heard Sean volunteer. No, I did not. No, <laughs> no I was heard, supposed to not volunteering Sean, but you know, <laughs> maybe maybe Ian. <laughs> yeah, I'm too busy with all the other tasks. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so I have one last thing. I'm amazed that I sparked so much conversation. I thought this would be very quick, but it's yeah. right. Um, the last comment I wanted to make. I've been away for approximately four years, so I'm this weird combination of having some Drupal knowledge and an absolute beginner. Um, so I was, I was really interested to basically hear that the Drupal cliff is still very much a thing. Um, and it was borne out by, by my own experience. Um, and I also heard somebody, some random mid-level developer describe her path. And she talked about how the Drupal cliff had been a real problem for her. And then Dries, and I don't know who the other person was in one of, I think it was in one of in Dries's, um whatever they call that. Dries uh, now? Dries, yeah, Dries now. Um, they also <laughs> talked about it and they compared the, the, the steps required to, to contribute to Drupal to some other open source project. And um, there was something like 20 steps, you know, in terms of what the person had to do and who he had yeah. to reach out to, to explain something, to, and it took him a, a significantly, significantly longer time to contribute to Drupal than it did to whatever open source uh, project he was comparing it against. Um, was it Drupal core though, or a contrib project? I'm not on, honestly. I'm yeah, not I would sure. guess core. Yeah. yeah, I think it was core. And it was uh, compared against Symphony and um, Composer. Uh, yeah, and it was focused one... on like the tools that that he was using, like yeah. like a PR. Or like, do you do you already have a GitHub account? Well, I have to make one for Drupal.org. So it was very much like about like how many clicks it took. Mm. But I mean that that kind of maps to a beginner's experience. Yeah. Right. Well, the Drupal Association did put out an RFP for allowing people to create Drupal.org accounts from existing accounts like Google mm-hmm. accounts or GitHub accounts to try to, I think that's maybe was in response to that, or it's probably been a long-term goal, but. One, oh, of, interesting. The, one of the interesting things, if, if you saw the Dries note and when that video was playing in the chat, there was like a bunch of people just being like, I thought it was just me. Like yeah. I felt so dumb that I couldn't I would, contribute. I was one of those people. Yeah, <laughs> so I think that was really good to, when I, I saw them making the video and I was a little leery of like, oh, you know, it's, I don't know, very negative, not very negative, but you don't want to discourage people like, oh, it looks so hard that I won't try it. But, but then the other thing is like, obviously people are trying it now and having a hard time. So giving people the affirmation, like it's not just you, a lot of people are having trouble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. The good well, news- like that's one of the reasons why like Amy June won the Aaron Winborn Award, mm-hmm. right? Because she supports people through this process that needs support, right? Mm-hmm. And 
you know, maybe we can make the process so it doesn't need so much yeah. support. And then Amy June can help people do something more challenging than- Well, <laughs> or if you have people like Amy June, they will just be able to help more people because each person will yeah. take so much time. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> It was supposed to be a lightning talk of five minutes or less. Yeah, you struck lightning. <laughs> Sometimes. We'll just have to talk back to the queries next time. Oh, man. Was there another Ian, question? If it makes you feel list? better, Drupal makes me feel dumb every day. <laughs> well, WordPress makes me feel like my head's going to explode. That's why yeah. I'm not going to do any more of it. Was there another question on the list, Sean? I just had that, that little containers query thing, but I will, yeah. I will, I will actually make a real thing and not just talk for okay. next month. Bye. All right. Oh, I had one last thing. Did anybody see? I posted in Drupal Slack. There's a nurses hackathon this weekend, which I thought was really cool. <laughs> Let me see if I can find the link. Uh, Pana, do you have it? Is Pana still on? Oh yeah, here we go. I'll post it in chat. I'm now. still here. Nurses. You found it? Yeah, I'm going to post it in New Jersey Slack. Uh, so folks, I have a question for you. Everybody mm -hmm. is a Drupal uh, experts over here and they are using WordPress at for some point, uh, some way, somehow. How does uh, Salesforce uh, uh, add to the picture? Because none of you guys mentioned Salesforce. You mentioned Sitecore, but not Salesforce. Salesforce is web? product or Salesforce's main product? Everything. Salesforce is also a CMS system, right? Mm -hmm. Content mm, management. Sort of. It can be. Yeah, it's not It's not mostly what, I mean, it's mostly a, um, CRM. a CRM, so customer relationship management software, right? So it's mostly private internal to like a sales team, mm. not a public facing website. Right, but it can be, it is used also with the public facing and mm -hmm. a lot Yeah, it can be. Um, yeah, like registering for events and doing a whole bunch of things like that. Not just registering for Yeah, events, but I mean like, yeah, it's one example. Yeah. So uh, when you all mentioned about uh, why Drupal is not being uh, liked uh, by others and it's not being considered as a shiny new thing to work on, I'll give you my perspective. Uh, it's a... Uh, Drupal is a little bit uh, tough for uh, newbies to come in mm -hmm. and uh, get anything done, even if they come in with a different uh, 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 toolbox that they have used and worked on. Why is that? Why are people not giving a chance to folks and saying, okay, we'll get you in? Because if you know some language or any language, isn't that a, a solid foundation on uh, a learning part? Uh, like uh, what you guys are do using uh, the Python uh, with, uh, uh, with the uh, new thing that Ted was just talking about. Python is not Drupal, but yet you guys are using it. So, and if, if folks can uh, write uh, Python and anything else, wouldn't the other way around be true too? If people who are writing Python or, or worked on um, let's say C or C++ or even Java, wouldn't they be able to pick up Drupal? I mean, it's yes and no. Like the hard part of Drupal is not necessarily even the language, right? Like, I mean, the syntax is very much like C, but PHP still has its quirks, but like understanding Drupal's internal architecture is, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the hard part, right? Like, so because you can't, I mean, you could try to fix a really trivial problem without understanding that. But if you want to try to un like fix a more complex problem or you know write a contributor module, like you have to understand something about Drupal's architecture and something about the Drupal API. Um, and that's I think that's where the learning curve is. Not and you know people like and again I think it's driven by use case. Like if you come to Drupal and you're like I'm using Drupal and I experience this very specific bug you may be, yeah, people may welcome you and want to work with you and help to fix it. But um, sometimes things that seem like a really simple bug are actually so complicated to, you know, it's like you hit an edge case and you've experienced it as a bug, but in order to, yeah. to fix that is, um, 
like has wide ranging implications. So I think that's sometimes why it seems unwelcoming and people maybe aren't good at explaining it. Um, so I, I think it'd be, I'd be curious to know if you, you had a specific bug and you were trying to fix it, you know, you know, what your experience was or, or are you just wondering in general why, why the learning curve is steep? No, learning curve is not steep uh, in uh, my humble opinion. Uh, it's, uh, everything is rocket science. Uh, even Python is a rocket science or uh, JSON is a rocket science. Drupal has started using uh, YAML and uh, is also using JSON uh, to do that. A few, uh, couple of uh, versions ago, Drupal didn't use to do any of that. So they have migrated, they have put on the shiny objects and they have used the shiny objects as uh, Ian would say. My mm. question is more of uh, in the line of uh, um, any, any uh, 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 technology or any uh, framework uh, is going to be complex. Salesforce is complex, yes. Uh, you all mentioned that Salesforce is more for uh, salespeople. No, it's more than that. I thought so too, initially, sales forces for sales uh, uh, initiatives and uh, calls and uh, meetings and all that only or for marketing people till I started attending Salesforce. And I was like, wow, you guys can do so much more. It's, it's a lot more complexity. Mm -hmm. Same way Drupal is complex too, but if you start inviting people in or if you start being, uh, letting them come in and start using it, all those jobs, my the reason I'm bringing this up is all those jobs that are out there that people are looking for Drupal, they will be filled up very fast because you are letting someone come in and say, here you go, it's a shiny object, break it. And they're gonna break it and they're gonna then fix it too. It's not gonna be complex. If, it's, if, it, if it can be broken, they found a security uh, breach somewhere and they found a hole somewhere and that's the bug. Like you said, the edge case, they found that edge case and it's solved then. But let, let them come in, let them uh, venture with it and run with it. It does not, it truly does not take that much long time. The learning curve is there, but mm. give them the directions and yeah. give them uh, initially, uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, uh, way back, uh, I don't know if Sean and uh, Pete, uh, Peter, if you recall, way back when you first started the first uh, Drupal camp uh, in, in, in Princeton, I right. was new to it. The documentation was horrendous. Mm -hmm. It was not easy to follow it. And uh, it, was, it was a nightmare, but still, uh, I was like, okay. Uh, and then uh, I got other jobs and everything. So I moved away from it. Has anything of that sort uh, been fixed? I haven't taken a look at it now, so I cannot say if it's getting better or not. But uh, that could be that could be the uh, golden gun. Uh, that could be the uh, main uh, trigger reason of why people are not coming in and getting uh, Drupal jobs anymore, or why people are being hesitant in applying for it. There are enough developers out there, by the way, guys. What are I mean, for? like I think one of the things is the profit margins in Drupal agencies are small. Really? No, it's and, not. What, well, what do you, Kathy, what do you I, think of profit margin? Like, like, I don't, when I think of like a Drupal agency, I think of like a company that's like, I don't know, five to 300 people. Okay. Right? Okay. But like, how many people does Salesforce employ? But five to three hundred. I don't. I do not know the number. So if if you go with five mm -hmm. to three hundred, uh, let's uh, stick with that five to three hundred. That five to three hundred uh, four uh, company is uh, still going. Uh, is still uh, uh, complaining or grumbling and saying, "Hey, we cannot find any Drupal developers." Right, uh, because they don't charge their customers. Mm -hmm. a high enough markup to be able to put two people on every task. And in order to give somebody a chance at a job who doesn't already know Drupal, you have to build in the cost of training them on Drupal into your other uh, tickets that, that custo other customers are paying for. 
So if I run a company and I have five Drupal people already hired and are already working tickets and, you know, maybe I'm like, you know, really I'm the CEO and I'm making a lot of money, right? So maybe I'm making like $150,000 or like $200,000 and I'm the CEO of a five person company, right? Like that's a lot of money and I'm pretty proud of myself. And I'm like, I want to hire somebody who doesn't know Drupal and our company is going to mentor them and mm -hmm. teach them Drupal. I have to plan the cost of paying that person's salary and at least half of another one of my person's salary to train them. And so I'm going to have to tr start charging my current customers mm -hmm. more money in order to pay somebody so that I can train them. Right. And the competition in Drupal agencies, I don't think one agency could suddenly, you know, increase their rates by like 30, 40 percent and and still get work. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I don't think Drupal companies are as big as WordPress, as you know, Adobe or site, you know, Salesforce. Like I think they're small companies and the financial pressures are tight. We don't have CEOs who are making a hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. right? Like we don't have that kind of uh, wiggle room in the budget. All right. Okay, so let, let me, uh, all good points, uh, all uh, uh, good uh, data points. So let me point out this way. If we go back uh, to uh, Salesforce, uh, way back when uh, they were having a very small community and they didn't start off being such a big mm -hmm. con conglomerate, conglomerate and they did not have so such a high markup and everything right salesforce has purchased mulesoft and salesforce has purchased uh, tableau which is high end products but on in their own uh, perspective and fields they also all started with a very small thing mm -hmm. my point is uh, you don't have to have a markup currently if you have uh, five people and you have uh, so six projects coming in and your six projects are uh, uh, handled by uh, three people, but uh, you need more people to do this, you can easily bring one more person in. As uh, Sean just mentioned, if you know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, isn't that what uh, Drupal is using? No, mm, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> the learning curve is the problem, right? And I think you're comparing, you're compa comparing like, apples to oranges. A, yeah, you're comparing an agency to a, you know, publicly listed company that is venture backed that basically oh, no, no. was able to get millions of dollars to build up this massive community of people no 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 you know no I mean? sean, no no sean uh, uh, it's i'm not comparing an agency with a publicly trading i'm comparing uh jobs with the jobs so uh it's not uh, it's okay all, in all fairness uh I'm, I'm surprised nobody asked me this so how come i didn't get a job in salesforce same problem. Salesforce is also not willing to let someone new come in and do this unless until they have any some certificates. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have got it, a job by uh, in Salesforce. Yeah. But point is, why is people? Why are people being so uh, tight on letting someone come in and say, "Okay, learning curve will be there." We have so many meetups. There is so many meetups uh, with Drupal, a lot more than uh, uh, WordPress. And Ian would tell you. WordPress mm -hmm. is not easy to get answers. It, it is a challenge in itself. Yeah, but a, Yet, a, a difference between a WordPress meetup and a Drupal meetup is I had a problem with email, oddly enough, um, on WordPress. And I went on a WordPress meetup and I got three guys to spend an hour talking about it, trying to figure it out, and they didn't. And I got on this another meetup the next day where some, some of the same people were on the meetup. And we spent pretty much the entire meetup, like two and a half hours trying to figure out my problem. We never did fix it, but we, we spent two and a half hours. You would never get that kind of uh, uh, support 
because um, the Drupal community requires you to come in having tried to fix the problem yourself to a certain extent. WordPress, because they have this shared pain, um, will will take you in at a lower level. Um, well, you did go, did you not go in uh, by saying that you have tried X, Y, and Z and you couldn't figure it out? Yeah, but um, I still feel like I got, I figure I got like 30 hours of expert support over those two nights, <laughs> which I don't think I would have gotten. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have asked for a Drupal meetup. I wouldn't have felt right asking for it on a Drupal meetup. Because you know Drupal. No, I don't know Drupal terribly well. But you could have asked. I mean, we. You, but you, that's you, what we're you, here for. If you would have said after thirty it's minutes, it's a web developer meetup. It doesn't have on. to just you be Drupal. Said after thirty minutes, right. we can move on. But I would also challenge Kathy's thing about um, the margin because I used to be on the other side of this when I was at Cody. We we had like million dollar budgets for agencies to come in and pitch against and. We didn't go for the low end. Uh, we went for the company that we thought was technically solid. Um, Smart move. <laughs> we got a lot of resistance because people wanted to go with the, the, the low bid or because we were very marketing heavy, they wanted to go with the prettiest site. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, I would wager that even the company who had the highest bid mm -hmm. still has so tight a margin within their own company that mm -hmm. they cannot afford to pay a person who doesn't know Drupal to learn it and part of a person who they could be putting to work earning money to also train that person. It's and I would, and I would... extremely, it's like, it's like, I mean, what would, it would cost like a hundred thousand dollars. It would Kathy, cost the company a hundred thousand dollars. Are you like not gonna give those people at that company raises that year? No, no. Like, oh, I'm sorry. You, we're not giving two <laughs> percent raises it, to Kathy, people. You're, you're we have to cut to those back. Okay. Like, I just, I don't. You're yeah. trapped in that death spiral where <laughs> you're, there are no, there are no people out there. There's the expert people who have more job offers than they can process mm -hmm. and there are beginners who can't get a job and there's a massive resource gap where they just yeah um and you've got to break the spiral right company. but i thought the question was why don't companies just hire people and train them up like if the que if the, if that's if we we're talking about a different question like maybe we're talking about like how do we get more people good paying jobs in drupal like let's talk about that Right, like let's talk about how do we solve the problem, not and I, and I, why I, isn't I, this one particular solution the answer to the problem? How is that different? Because then we're arguing with each other how is, how is instead that of collaborating. Uh, uh, what are, what are, Kathy, how is that different? What are the other solutions? Wait, how is that different from? Uh, uh, how come companies are not hiring people and training, whereas uh, uh, find solution to? Uh, uh, bring more Drupal people in? How is that different? It's the same thing, right? You're, you're supposed to be training somewhere, somehow. So I think you're, you've hit the nail on the head. And I think, Sean, if you could write that down, <laughs> I think I would love to, to do a lightning talk on that. Like, right, sign me up. I'll do 10 minutes on a future meetup and we'll okay. explore that a little bit. All right, we have a featured speaker. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so something good came out of it anyway. <laughs> right. I did put a couple uh, curious facts in the last in-person Salesforce conference had 171,000 attendees. God. Um, so just <laughs> scale <laughs> of that enterprise, yeah, of the people involved. What was is the charge? What was the- Radically uh, different. And yeah, they probably each paid- Hundreds of thousands like, of dollars, yeah. I'm they sure. probably each paid $5,000, right? Or something, yeah. Um, and now they own so, Slack, so hey, we're all using Salesforce. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, yeah, and there is a, a, I did put a link to the, the rendered version of the Drupal user guide, which is supposed to help you get started, which is much more polished. I think Jennifer Hodgson spearheaded that, but I don't know. 
still don't know how approachable that is, but it's it's something. It's supposed, I think it's the best free documentation for a version of Drupal that Drupal has ever had. Yeah, well, that's certainly true. <laughs> I agree 100%. So, but, I'm still so, not sure how approachable it is. <laughs> right. But it, like, if you were disappointed with Drupal 7's documentation, this is worth a try. It's mm. orders of magnitude better. It's mm. like, it's just like a book that you would have to pay for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so uh, Ian and myself uh, both had this experience. Uh, we both were trying uh, to uh, install DDEV. Boy, following that instructions, I, and we are, uh, we are not, uh, uh, we are not uh, uh, dummies, uh, I would, uh, in the humble I'm, world, I'm but we are. I'm not stupid. I, I reserve judgment <laughs> upon myself. Okay. So we are not that, but we are, we are tech savvy and we can read instructions and we can mm -hmm. read uh, uh, documentations. I went through it line by line. I went through it step by step. And guess what the answers were most, to most of the things? Oh, yeah, you don't have to do that. Oh, yeah, you don't have to do that. So how come it's there? Because, say, because there's just one guy supporting it. And it's right. actually well, now the company went belly up. So, you know, maybe that's not the vote to put our... our uh... Eggs in it? Yeah. <laughs> no, Wait, I think which company people, went belly up? DDEV, the like, for-profit company. Yeah. The project lives uh, on, but the company behind it, um, like at DrupalCon, was like, yep, we're closing down in like 30 days. They were like trying to be a host and yeah. other things. So the people who used to work there are looking for work. Mm -hmm. hmm. All right. Well, on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Let's finish on a happy note. Somebody said yeah. I think, right. it's, I think it's gotten better, in fairness, after having been away for three to four years. I mean, I wasn't even aware about this of this document that Kathy just posted, and it looks great. Um, so I might even read it. <laughs> there you go. Well, Peter Peter did the hard work. He posted it. I just said it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Bookmarking it now. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so more fun next month. Um, mm -hmm. Same place, I, same time. Probably.